This morning we're going to be looking at Judges chapter 17, verses 7 through 13. We're continuing this five-chapter segment at the end of the book of Judges that gives us an overview of what life was like for the ordinary person in the land of Israel during the time of the Judges. And as we mentioned last week, everybody worships something or someone. And it's either scriptures revealed God or it's man's own imagination. And Israel was still religious during the time of the judges, and yet it was worship that seemed right in their own eyes. And we met a man by the name of Micah, and when Micah decided to worship Jehovah his own way, he ended up creating his own religion. And the practice of his faith was his own business. He would worship as he chose to, as he wanted to. An unsaved man's problem isn't a lack of information. Man's real problem is sin and the alienation that sin creates with a holy God. And that alienation is so great that the Bible uses the term enmity to describe it. Enmity is a violent hatred. And the Bible says that unsaved man has a violent hatred toward God. When the Bible says that unsaved people hate God, we need to understand what that means. Most unregenerate people don't hate the idea of a God. They hate the God of the Bible. They love the idea of the man upstairs. They call upon a generic lowercase g God, or they idealize a God who agrees with them. They embrace that sweet Jesus of liberalism who dined with tax collectors and with sinners, but the biblical Jesus who condemned sin and sinners, who will one day judge our thoughts and our actions and our motives and our words by the Bible, he isn't liked. And worse, the Old Testament God who demanded Israel destroy entire nations and peoples because of their sins, well, he's despised. The unsaved world is very happy with a God of their own making, one who seems right in their own eyes. But the biblical God who demands belief and submission and obedience, he is hated. If they did like him, the God of the Bible, then they would embrace everything that the Bible says about him. If they believed him, then they would abandon their unbiblical concepts about him. And if they loved him, they would obey him. They don't really love God. They love the God of their own imagination, whom they worship in their own way. So rather than accept, believe, love, and obey the God of the Bible, they do exactly what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. See, they trade the glory of God and the God of glory for the image of God that's found in the creation. Humanity that God created to demonstrate his own glory robs his glory for himself. And the unsaved person's claim of earthly wisdom is really heaven's folly. Only sentences later in Romans chapter 1, Paul wrote that God gives sinners up to sin and to lies and to serving the creature rather than the creator, to homosexuality and to rejecting God as he reveals himself in the pages of scripture. The title of the message this morning is Worship in Our Own Image. Follow along as I read Judges chapter 17, and I'll start with verse number seven. Now there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah of the family of Judah. He was a Levite and he was staying there. And the man departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. Then he came to the mountains of Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, Where do you come from? 
So he said, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I am on my way to find a place to stay. Micah said to him, Dwell with me, and be a father and a priest to me, and I will give you ten shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes, and your sustenance. So the Levite went in. Then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. So Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord, notice Lord, all capitals, that's Yahweh, Jehovah, now I know that Jehovah will be good to me because I have a Levite as priest. Now, Levites were one of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And when Israel entered the land of Canaan, God gave the Levites no territory of their own. But God spread the Levites throughout the whole country and gave them 48 cities of their own in which to dwell. The men of Levi served the priests. Their job was to sing at the tabernacle, to teach the Bible, to carry the ark and all of its furnishings, and to care for the physical needs of the priests and of the tabernacle and later the temple. They were, as scripture calls them, God-given gifts to Aaron and his sons, the priests. Now, priests were also from the tribe of Levi, but they were the male descendants of Aaron. They were ordained by God to make the sacrificial offerings as well as to teach the law to the people. So the priests did the spiritual ministry, if you will, and the Levites took care of the physical needs. Here in our text this morning, we're introduced to a Levite who is from the city or the town of Bethlehem. But Bethlehem was not one of the 48 cities where the Levites were supposed to live. Just like Elimelech and Naomi in the book of Ruth, this young man was looking for a more promising situation outside of God's direction. And he ends up in Micah's town somewhere in northern Israel. The text describes him as a young man. The Hebrew word literally is he is a boy. Now, that doesn't mean he's three, but it means he was a young man, not old enough yet to grow a full beard. Now, one of the first signs of spiritual neglect is a failure to support the work of God. As Israel forsook the Lord, they also forsook their support of the Levites and the priesthood. Nehemiah wrote about that problem in his own day. And we need to remember that in God's universe, nothing happens by accident, nothing happens by mistake. God had a purpose in this encounter between Micah and this young Levite. And you and I can't know all of the reasons for God's providence, but we should understand that God put these two men together as a test. Remember also, God never tests us to find out what we are made of, so he can figure out what we're going to do. His test is always so that we will know what is in our hearts. And how we pass through that test is either evidence that we trust in God, or the test is a shout as a witness against us. Micah and this Levite, both doing what seemed to be right in their own eyes, failed the test. So Micah grabs the bull by the horn. Last time we saw that he had taken and made one of his own sons the priest in his house, the priest over his own religion. Now he replaces the son that he ordained as the household priest, and he replaces him with a man who has real credentials. It shouldn't surprise us that since Micah was willing to make images of Jehovah according to his own imagination, that he wouldn't also take and make priests according to his own imagination. Micah wasn't happy with his own son being the priest, so he wanted someone with real credentials, someone with a real background. He wanted a better young priest, and the young Levite appeared to be like an answer from the Lord himself. Everything for Micah's worship was falling right into place for him. 
He was absolutely sure that his good fortune was God's blessing. His sincere religious efforts were being favored by God, but he was actually mistaken. You know, a feeling of peace or details falling into place are not indications of God's blessing. Sometimes those are evidences of a sin-hardened heart that God is preparing to judge. So Micah hires the young man to be a priest. But look at what else the text says about Micah's intention and what happens. Verse number 10, Micah said to him, dwell with me and be two things, be a father and a priest to me. Now look down at verse 11. Then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became more than a priest and more than a father. He became like one of Micah's sons to him. Now, a priest is a mediator, someone who stands between God and man. A father is someone with authority. Bizarrely, though, the priest father also became a son to Micah. This kid from Bethlehem was really making it out pretty well. You know, man has an unusual and contrary desire. On one hand, every one of us wants to be the God of our own lives, of our own universe. And yet at the very same time, we each know that we need somebody else to minister on our behalf. We act like our own deity, but we feel the need for somebody else to intercede for us. Somebody else who is going to represent us. And deep within, everyone knows there is only one God, the God of the Bible. But the Bible also tells us that Jesus is the only priest. He is the only mediator. He is the only one who can stand between man and God. He is the only one who is acceptable to God the Father. And that's why in Protestantism, we reject calling someone a priest. We have no one to stand between us and God but Jesus. Amen. Now, under the Old Testament law of Moses, the Levites received a portion of all of the tithes and the sacrifices, but they also lived off of the flocks that they raised. So they had basically three sources of income. This young Levite that we read of here in our text was what the Bible calls a hireling. A hireling is not really a shepherd. The hireling doesn't care for and he doesn't love the sheep. He doesn't even own the sheep. He's basically a professional servant who's willing to do anything for a price. The hireling's interest is himself. Roger Lestrange served several kings of England back in the 1600s. His last official position in the king's court was to control what people were saying and writing about the king. His job was to make sure that no one ever said anything negative about the king, and he could use any power that he had to stop people from criticizing the person in authority. But he did have something very interesting to say about Christian men in ministry. Let me quote for you. He that serves God for money will serve the devil for better wages. And that's exactly what the Bible calls a hireling. Genesis chapter 4 verse number 2 says that Adam and Eve's son Abel was the first shepherd. He was one who kept sheep. And from there on throughout scripture, shepherds play a significant role in the Bible. Jacob and his wife, Rachel, were both shepherds. So was Moses, David, the prophet Amos. And who can forget the shepherds who were brought the announcement of the birth of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that baby born in Bethlehem. The Old Testament has dozens of mentions that God is the shepherd of his people. And then you have Hebrews 13, 20, where Jesus is called the great shepherd of the sheep. Shepherding begins in the book of Genesis, and it illustrates God's guidance and his providing and his protection of his people. 
But scripture also describes political leaders and religious leaders as shepherds of the sheep. So we shouldn't be surprised then that Jesus would call himself a shepherd. Keep your hand in Judges and go to the book of Acts, chapter number 20. Acts chapter 20, Paul is preaching, he's ministering to a group of elders, a group of pastors. Let's go back to verse number 27. Paul tells them, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He didn't just preach a couple things or topics that were of interest to the congregation or subjects important in the news. The Apostle Paul preached everything that was recorded in Scripture. Verse 28, Therefore, because I haven't been afraid or ashamed to preach everything that God says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Paul says Jesus gives pastors a responsibility as shepherds of the flock, which he also calls the church of God. That job is to guide spiritually. I can't tell you which way you should take to get home. That's not my responsibility, but to guide you spiritually, to guide, to provide. I'm not here to provide you with all kinds of information and tickle your ears. My job is to guide you, to provide spiritual food for you, but also to protect you spiritually. And the more you know the word of God, the more protected you will be. So that's my responsibility over the flock, which Paul calls the church of God. And notice something significant about this flock, about this church of God. Paul writes that God purchased the flock with his own blood. I can't go any further in this passage without noting a great truth in that verse. The flock, which is called the church of God, in the very next phrase, God purchased it with his own blood. Now, who redeemed the church with his blood? Jesus. Paul here is saying that Jesus is God. Jesus is divine. And yet, I still hear people saying Jesus never said that he was God, and Jesus was not God. Now, our passage doesn't make Jesus God the Father. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed to the Father. He wasn't praying to himself. So the Father is God, but Jesus is not the Father, and yet Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is called God. In Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, and yet Jesus isn't the Holy Spirit. We have here in Acts chapter 20 a proof of the deity of Jesus, but also of the Trinity, the Trinity of the Godhead. We have God the Father, we have God the Son, and we have God the Holy Spirit. Now turn back just one book from Acts to the Gospel of John, John chapter 10. Now in John chapter 10, Jesus used three different pictures of the shepherd and sheep. And in these three parables, he described the leadership or the shepherding of the Jewish religious leaders. Start with me in verse number one. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger." Jesus used this illustration, but they, speaking of the religious leaders, they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, verse 7, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. 
I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and go out, and he will find pasture. Do you see those three responsibility of the shepherd in this? To guide, to provide, and to protect. Verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and he scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling. He does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. Jesus, in these three parables, calls Israel's leaders by some interesting words. He calls them strangers, thieves, and robbers. Then he ends by calling them hirelings while he calls himself the good shepherd. The word good for shepherd there is the Greek word that means something or someone that is worthy, beautiful, excellent, or attractive, genuine. Jesus is the genuine shepherd of the sheep. We finished with Jesus' statement, not only that he was the good shepherd, but that a good shepherd will die for his sheep. And Jesus was looking forward at that point to the cross. A good shepherd will die for his sheep because they are precious, because they belong to him. But the hireling doesn't take any kind of personal ownership or responsibility for the sheep. He has no relationship really with his flock. He really labors only for what he gets out of it. And because he has no relationship with the sheep, at the very first sign of trouble, the hireling will abandon God's flock. He will run from the duty that he's been paid to perform. The hireling works in the ministry for personal gain. It could be the gain of popularity or of reputation or of money or influence. It's any purpose other than serving God and his glory. It's for any purpose other than the benefit of the sheep. You know, the Bible doesn't condemn a pastor for being paid for serving God and serving God's people. In fact, the Bible requires those who faithfully teach the word of God to be paid for the word that they preach. The problem, though, is when a man serves for his own personal gain, when that becomes his goal, when that becomes his purpose. A shepherd is paid for loving the work and for doing it well. A hireling works for the love of payment. A hireling goes where the money flows. In verse number 11, Jesus said that the hireling is revealed when the wolf appears. Character is revealed in testing. Our conduct always conforms to our character. What we do is because of who we are. And our character is best revealed when we're tested. Think back to this Levite here in Judges chapter 17. He didn't go where God told him to go. He went where he could find money. And that took him to all kinds of places. And he ends up at the house of Micah. He ends up, as far as we know, at the house of the highest bidder. He was disinterested in the honor of God. He was out of God's will. One, he left God's provision. As a Levite, he was supposed to be in the Levitical city. Instead, he went to Bethlehem, and then he goes out anywhere and everywhere looking for the money. He didn't care about the truth of God. He wasn't qualified to serve as a priest under the word of God. He wasn't interested in the welfare of God's people. He was in the ministry for his own benefit. And making it all even worse, when we get to the next chapter, this young Levite might have been Moses's grandson. Think of that. So we need to fix our minds on one great truth. No one gets into heaven 
on the back of anyone other than the crucified and resurrected Jesus. Each person of every generation must personally come to faith in Jesus if that person's going to get to heaven. And this means that each person of each generation is also on the very brink of an eternity in the lake of fire. No one comes to God the Father except through personal faith in Jesus. And we need to rely on Jesus and Jesus alone to get us from here to eternity. Notice back in Judges chapter 17 what Micah does with this young man. In verse number 5, the man Micah made a shrine and made an ephod and a household idols. And he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Verse 12. So Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. He consecrated this Levite. The word is one that refers to something ordained. Micah ordained an unqualified Levite. And the word ordain or consecrate means to fill your hands. And in this case, his hands were being filled with religious authority and also money. But according to scripture, only God ordains people to his service. He ordains people to serve him according to a biblical standard man then recognizes. I, for instance, have no power to ordain anyone. God ordains people into his service. Paul wrote of this in the opening lines of the book of Galatians. Listen as I read verse number one from Galatians. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. God is the only one who ordains or consecrates someone to serve him. And yet today people declare themselves to be apostles and they declare themselves to be prophets. And then they turn around and they give that title to someone else of their own choosing. Self-appointed evangelists, self-made pastors compete for people and their purses by making all kinds of wild claims or having outlandish visions, promising miracles, or offering spiritual encounters. For these kinds of people, ministry is a circus act. It's not a holy service. They don't take it seriously. And more repulsive, these fraudulent hirelings get all the attention, and people trust them to get God's blessing. Be assured, Micahs and Levites will always find one another. Let's remember, God himself has set qualifications in Scripture for every believing congregation for a pastor. Unqualified pastors reveal a disqualified congregation. Back in Judges 17 and verse number 13 says, Micah said, Now I know that Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord will be good to me because or since I have a Levite as priest. Micah was a pagan idolater who thought he was worshiping God, but he proved he wasn't. He proved otherwise by worshiping in his own way. And he was absolutely convinced, the text says, he knew, he was certain he was positive that with his own Levitical priest, whom he ordained, Jehovah, the Lord, would certainly bless him. He believed that sincerity in his paganism, in his false belief, would get him God's favor. He'd fallen for spiritual experience, for religious tradition instead of God's own revelation. He didn't care that scripture says God's not impressed with our sincerity. He's not interested in our religious devotion. He is not at all caring about our traditions as a way to reach him or to gain his favor. Your hands have done a little bit of walking. Let's walk again to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 3, 
Let me start reading in verse number one. Paul here is warning what false teachers and false believers will be like in the last days, in the days in which we live. Verse one, but know this, that in the last days, perilous, testing, trying, difficult, the word literally means days of being squeezed, will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Do you notice some interesting phrases there? Verse number two says they will love themselves, they will love money. Verse three says they will be unloving. So they'll love themselves and they'll love their money, but they're not going to really love anybody or anything else. And then verse four says they will love pleasure rather than love God. So beware of a world that says they love God, but don't believe him, don't trust him, don't serve him, and don't obey him because they are liars worshiping in their own image. Verse five, they will have a form of godliness, but deny its power. And from such people turn away. Verse five says these false teachers, false pastors, false prophets, false apostles, and their false followers, false Christians will have a form of godliness. The word form that Paul uses there is the Greek word morphosis. It means to have an appearance, the shape of something. False teachers and false believers, Paul says, have a shape of godliness, but by their character and their actions, they actually deny God. Their actions deny what they are saying or preaching or saying that they follow. They are appearing to be something on the outside. The inside is completely void of. And then Paul admonishes, don't try to correct them. Don't try to bring them in. Don't try to coddle them. Avoid them. Stay away from them. Turn away from them. These people look so right in our sin-blinded eyes, but we're being fooled so that we don't even care how they look in God's eyes. For 15 years, I was part of a denomination that struggled just to maintain its numbers. And here in the Pacific Northwest, the organization's leaders adopted a plan in order to boost the number of people who were attending open Bible churches. Some of you were intimately involved in this plan or knew of it. Pastors had to conduct in-person surveys of the people that were living around the church building and questions focused on what the people in the community wanted in a local church. And then the results were used by the church leaders to shape the church to meet the desire of all the neighbors. It melded biblical Christianity with whatever the beliefs were in the community. Let's take them both and mix them together and come up with a plan that will make people want to come to your church. It was growth at the compromise of truth. And we were told, I was told about this church growth program and told that it was voluntary. But if you as the pastor refuse to participate, you would lose your standing with the organization, and thus you would also lose your pastorate. It's voluntary, but if you don't volunteer, you're out. And I raised concern, and I said that neither I nor my church would participate in this, and I took it to the church board. The church is to be what God calls it to be in the scripture, not what the local community desires. That's a social club. That is not the assembly of the saints. God's favor is according to his mercy and to his grace alone. 
truth is more vital than devotion to false worship. And that's really a problem for every idolater and every religionist. Micah was guilty of worshiping a God that he had shaped in his own image. He was practicing what we call syncretism. We've mentioned that word before. It's mixing biblical worship with the religion, in this case, of the Canaanites. Mixing the religion of the world with the religion of God. And syncretism is an especially deceptive false religion. It's the marriage of biblical worship and biblical truth with paganism. Rather than outright paganism or outright false religion, it takes a little bit of the Bible and mixes it with a lie. How much falsehood do you need for it to really be a lie? Just a smidge. One of the best examples of syncretism that I know of in Scripture is found in the book of Exodus, chapters 30 and 32. I'm going to have you turn, please, to Exodus chapter 32. Israel had been free from slavery in Egypt only for a few months, and they were camped at the base of Mount Sinai. And Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Lord's revelation. And while he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights, the people became afraid. They'd been watching CNN. They'd been listening to NPR. And they became convinced that God had abandoned them and God had actually killed Moses, their leader. You know, fear makes us do stupid things that we wouldn't do otherwise. We'll give up freedom and we will abandon common sense and reason to feel a little bit safer, and to feel like we're in control. Israel demanded that Moses' brother Aaron give them gods that they could see and who could lead them. Exodus 32, verse number 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods, plural, make us gods, that they shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the gold earrings in your ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand. Notice, he didn't have to demand it or require it. Their fear motivated them to seek something else, to give up their freedom in order to follow paganism. He received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and he made a molded calf. And then they said, this is your God singular. This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar in front of it. And Aaron made a proclamation and he said, Tomorrow is a feast day to Jehovah. And then they rose early on the next day and they offered burnt offerings and they brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink, the word is to get drunk, and rose up to play, and the word play there means to have sex. Israel willingly turned over their gold, and they demanded gods, plural, but Aaron created one God. He created a single golden calf in the image of the chief god of the Egyptians. His name was Apis. The Egyptian chief god was a cow. And when this calf was unveiled in front of the people, the text says that the people shouted, This is your God, O Israel, the one who brought you up out of Egypt. Pay attention to what the text says. They never said that the calf replaced God. They said the calf was God. They said the calf was Jehovah. You see what fear brought them to do? And then Aaron, to top it all off, says tomorrow is a feast day to Jehovah. It was syncretism. 
They weren't directly worshiping other gods. They weren't worshiping Baal or Molech. They weren't even directly worshiping Satan. Israel's children said they were worshiping Jehovah. They said they were worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. They mixed non-biblical ideas with biblical worship. Syncretism either adds or it subtracts from what God says in the Bible about himself and about his worship. And syncretism comes in a lot of different forms. It can be a ritual to get something from God. It might be lighting a candle or repeating a prayer or decreeing and declaring faith-filled words. It might be paying a tithe or sacrificing or fasting from something. Maybe if we just pray the right words, or maybe if we just pray hard enough, then we'll convince God to do what we want. Syncretism is superstition at its very best. Syncretism is serving God in a way that seems best to us. It's what we've seen others do. It's what's popular. It's what feels right. It's what will draw a crowd and then keep a crowd. It takes the best of what we like and it produces a modern, higher way than what our ancestors knew that the Bible commands. Remember the old spiritual? Give me that old time religion. Today, the world is full of making new religion because the old religion doesn't work. I had a young man in Africa tell me he wouldn't listen to a single thing that I had to say because I'm too old. I don't know how hard it is to be a 20-year-old today. Life is different than it ever was before, and I'm out of touch. I said to him, then you would be really disappointed if you met Noah or Abraham or David or Job or the prophets, because they were all old too. How about John? How about Paul? How about Peter? You know, that young man I've never heard from since. We're looking for a new way, a new religion, a new form of worship, something that meets a new generation. Well, anything new is a lie. We today come as we are and worship as we choose. It's my feelings. It's my desires. It's my interests. It's what seems right in my own eyes. And syncretism isn't tied to the Bible but it's tied to our feelings, it's tied to our culture, it's tied to our personal traditions and ideas. It's worship in our own image, not in God's image. God is very specific in the Bible about how he's supposed to be worshiped. We worship God as he commands us, not according to what's popular in our culture or what seems right in our own eyes. Biblical worship is much more than naming a generic God or even mentioning Jesus. You know, the devil has no problem saying the name of Jesus. So do false prophets. They say the name of Jesus. Look at the Mormons. Go look at the Jehovah's Witnesses. They talk about Jesus all the time, but it's a different Jesus than the Jesus of the Bible. Biblical worship is service in spirit and in truth that focuses on the biblical Jesus. And it's devoted to the glory of God the Father. Next week, when we get into the next chapter of the book of Judges, we're going to find out what happens with Micah and with his newly crowned priest slash father slash son. So you can read ahead and find out the misery that they will heap on themselves for their disobedience to the almighty one true living God of Scripture.